Are you a maker? Then here's two ways for you to step up and make a difference in the season of giving. The holiday season approaches and with that, the giving of gifts. And maybe you're even someone who uses your creativity and tools such as a 3D printer to create these gifts. If you do own a 3D printer and or design your own parts, then Toys for Tots needs you. Earlier this year, I made a video about 3D prints that would convert non-believers. And one of the categories I discussed was called trinkets with value. In that section, we met Liam from the Astro Printer channel, who was a contributor to Toys for Tots. Toys for Tots is a program run by the US Reserve uh, Marines. They basically raise money and buy toys for those who are in need. IC3D works with the uh, Toys for Tots program through the, the US uh, Reserve Marines. So last year, 429 makers like myself turned around and printed 68,900 toys for, the, for the, uh, children in need. And, and it'll be given to them around Christmas. We do like small little stocking stuffers, like these little chameleons. Then we have the flexi toys, which a lot of kids really like these flexi triceratops and flexible dolphins. But we also get into doing stuff like larger toys, like trains and so on, that we actually 3D print and they get donated to the kids for um, kids in need around the Christmas time at the end of the year. Now it's too late to print toys for this Christmas, but perhaps you might consider joining the volunteers for next year. The website you need is linked in the description, and you might even consider joining those who live stream their 3D printing. It's definitely one way that you can make a difference. I became aware of a second way to make a difference when I was a guest on Jerry's Saturday 3D Printing Maker Chat live stream. To everybody here and anyone listening, who knows anyone who does modeling and make uh, and design? But I need someone who is willing to come up with a design of toys for Toys for Tots I and donate the, the, the design to, to, to us for, for printing for next year, not for this year. I think my skill set and qualifications are perfect for this. And better yet, I have this channel as a platform to encourage others to donate their time and creativity as well. If we come to the IC3D Industries website, which manages the 3D printed additions to Toys for Tots, we can see the 2021 selection of 3D models. There's some great designs on display here, and I'm urging you to join me in trying to add even more. So I got back in contact with Liam to establish some criteria for what would make a suitable design. All of these can be grouped into two different categories. The first is how well suited the toy is for kids up to an age of 12. Ultimately, they have to be fun to play with. And to maximize their appeal, I don't think they should be gender specific. Kids should be able to use them without any safety hazards. And it's reasonable to expect that any printed toys won't break easily. So for me, that rules out intricate resin printed minis, as spectacular as they are. The second category relates to the ease of manufacture for the volunteer printing the toys. Any Toys for Tots design should avoid the need for support material. They should stick well to the 3D printer's bed, as we don't want anyone wasting time or filament printing spaghetti on difficult parts. Also to make life easy, I think it's best to avoid steep overhangs as we want the toys to be able to be printed on any 3D printer, not just ones with upgraded part cooling. Finally, we want minimal assembly or preferably no assembly. We don't want any of the volunteers to have to spend extra money buying hardware, and we also don't want them to spend additional time on putting these toys together. So I think printed parts that snap together without the need for tools or instruction should be as far as assembly requirements go. A bonus objective might be designing toys that don't require a heap of time to print or a heap of filament. The existing train toy can take up to 16 hours depending on the printer, but surely quicker is better as is less filament. Now let's have a look at how I approached the brief and some tips to help you meet the criteria. What should have been my first step was to look at the existing models, because I decided I was going to do a dinosaur without checking when there was already several versions here. I think the reason I wanted to do a T-Rex was to take on the challenge of designing something like this that prints without support. And I did solve that problem by designing the body to be straight and to be printed upside down with the arms, legs and jaw printed separately and clipping on afterwards. But let's be honest, this doesn't look very good, particularly compared to the stunning model already in place by MacGyver. Looking for a new idea, I did some research by browsing some toy sections of online stores. And what caught my eye as something unique for Toys for Tots was this basketball set. 
Now obviously I can't really print something this big or this intricate, but I was keen to find a way to create a game of skill shooting at targets. So let me introduce you to my print in place catapult skill game. There are several parts, but most of them are already joined in a print in place mechanism that should come free immediately. And the only assembly required is to take the catapult arm and push down firmly onto the pivoting base to lock it into its final position. Here's how it works. The catapult arm is printed in an orientation that supplies maximum flexibility and spring. It's so flexible you can push it the whole way to the table without any chance of breaking. To play, we load up some cubes, put your other hand on the base to hold it in position, and then flick down with your finger to launch the catapult. The three baskets, labelled 1, 2 and 3 points depending on the distance, can be rotated into different positions, and the base of the catapult can rotate to let you aim. It's certainly not an easy game, but with some perseverance it is possible to score some points. Here's one of my favourite parts. When you finish playing, we can take the side of the catapult arm that has the indentation, load the cubes beneath it, and then if we wiggle and use gravity as our aid, the cubes will be trapped inside and stored securely. And when we want to play, we do the exact same procedure except in reverse, angling the arm outwards and using gravity with a jiggle to release the cubes. However, it seems inevitable that those cubes will be lost by the child at some stage. So I'm pleased to report that the catapult will still work with a variety of small items, pretty much anything, such as a tire valve cap, different types of beads, Lego minifigure heads, big tree tech rubber duckies, although they're probably too big to fit in the scoring basket, small stones and pebbles, and even scrunched up bits of paper. In fact, when I got my kids to test this out, they were more willing to shoot items that weren't the original cubes. That's my final product, but doesn't meet the criteria. Let's start with suitability for kids. My two are 9 and 11, and they both thought it was a nice idea. In terms of being fun, my biggest concern is the degree of difficulty. But because of that, it is rewarding once you finally get a basket. But what I would say is that even when ignoring the built-in baskets with the point system, a catapult is inherently fun, and I imagine that many kids would enjoy finding random little objects to send flying. But is a catapult safe? Firstly, I made sure it was small enough so that any projectiles are launched more softly than if you were just throwing them by hand. Secondly, through some trial and error, I made sure that even when the catapult is launched in its most powerful position, it's launched forward instead of up into the face of the user. Finally, is my design strong and durable? The print-in-place junctions have enough overlap that I was unable to pull them free, so hopefully a younger child won't be able to either. And the catapult arm printed in this orientation is surprisingly tough. If you were to bend it back as far as it can go, it deforms rather than snapping, but you can bend it back into the original position and it still seems to have plenty of spring. I also did a number of drop tests from different heights and angles and I was unable to break it. I would hope that this would be difficult to break by accident unless the child puts the toy in a very unusual situation. But how printable is this toy? Well, I would say very, so let's examine the reasons why. Ultimately, we want any Toys for Tots items to be easy to make. Let's look at the model in its assembled form for printing. Firstly, it doesn't need any support material. There are some parts that hang out in the air, but I've put a very gentle slope on them to avoid the need for any support material. As you can see, the main parts actually have a lot of surface area touching the bed. The catapult arm has much less so, which is why I added some of these features to expand its surface area. And across a variety of printers, fast and slow with different bed surfaces, I didn't have any catapult arms to attach and cause the print to fail. If we look inside the print in place joints, we can see we also have very shallow overhangs to help ensure success. So what was the process I followed when modeling this shape and what are my tips for print in place parts? Firstly, I started with a basic sketch to lay out the locations of the moving parts that would print in place. I then created the sketches for these joints, giving myself a healthy gap of 0.4 millimeters between the two parts. If I change the angle, you can see that this sketch was anchored to my original planning sketch, and that the two sections of the sketch were then revolved to create the separate parts that will be forever trapped together. We repeat this process a couple more times to create all three print in place joints, mirroring the joint on the side to create the fourth. From there, it's just a matter of adding on, sketching out the three baskets for point scoring, and merging these when extruding into the central pivot points of each print-in-place joint. 
The next sketches were to mark out the cutaways I wanted to have so when an extruded cut was made, I could get the range of motion required for each pivot point. The geometry could then be refined, cutting out any material not needed to save on filament and joining up the outer pivot points together, but again using thin material to save on filament. We add some simple embellishments such as the point scoring numbers and then features such as chamfers and fillets to make the design a little bit tidier. There's also a subtle chamfer the whole way along each edge on the underside. This reduces the possibility of each joint fusing together from elephant's foot, but also in situations like you're about to see, where a bit of stray filament went between the two parts, that little bit of extra clearance will help the bond break and get the part moving as intended. The final details on this part were hollowing out the center pivot and adding some mounting lugs. With the geometry for this main assembly finished, I created an assembly where I could move the parts, check for collisions, particularly by the use of section views. I was confident enough in the geometry of this portion to print it even before the catapult had been designed. I figured that's where the changes and iterations would be required. And so it proved, with this arm needing seven iterations, each of them printed independently, until I worked out the right clearance for that satisfying snap together assembly. With that resolved, I created another assembly with all of the parts in place, ready to export for printing. I'm pleased to report that this is small enough to print on a Prusa Mini, two side by side on an Ender 3, or four at a time on a printer with a 300 by 300 millimeter bed. Print time will of course depend on the printer, and the slowest that I clocked in was just over five hours, and my high-speed Core XY printers doing it in just over two hours. One more thing, this model can be printed with low infill as low as 10%, and that means each copy uses just under 70 grams of filament. For me, this was a fun project, and if you know CAD, consider donating some time over the holidays to submit your own toy. Just make sure you label and tag it Toys for Tots so it can be found. If you're looking to learn CAD to be able to create your own parts, I've got a playlist linked below that might be able to help you. Please remember that not every submitted design will be picked to join the pool. If mine doesn't get picked, that's fine, because it means that enough of you have created new designs that are better than mine, and that means the kids are the winners in the end. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy making a difference with your 3D printer. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.